Right. Yeah, so so uh, uh, last week we, we dealt with the, the New Testament. Uh, I didn't realize that, that Matt had really kind of redone lesson one instead of lesson two, and so we kind of skipped from the introduction to the New Testament, and now we're going back a little bit to the Old Testament, but I think that's actually very, very appropriate because we as, we as Orthodox Christians, we live the Old Testament, we experience the Old Testament, we interpret uh, the Old Testament in light of Christ, specifically in light of uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. And uh, this, is, this is really uh, uh, key, I think, to, to understanding uh, really Orthodox worship. So much of our worship is understanding, opening up those Old Testament experiences in light of the New Testament. Um, so, you know, maybe there's there's nowhere where that's more clear, despite our attempts to, to make it not clear, in the case of, of Bosca. So at the center of our Orthodox faith, at the center of our experiences as Christians, is the resurrection of Christ. This is the light by which we understand the Old Testament. Um, well, Pascha means Passover. We translate it into Easter. We don't translate it and keep it as Pascha. It's like we're trying to avoid helping people make this connection between the Exodus and what Christ came and did. Does this make sense so far? And so we can, we can uh, understand the Exodus in a lot of different ways. The main way the early church looked at it is typologically. And that's a big word that essentially means foreshadowing, right? And, and uh, so I think this is probably the, one of the easiest, best places to see. So the people of God enslaved to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, right? Humankind enslaved to the devil. Right? The people of Israel are called out. Right. And all so many of the, the little things, a lot of the things that really don't even apparently, you know, you kind of think about like, ah, that, that's odd. Right. You know, we talked about last week. God rested after creating the world. Like, was it he hiring? Was he pooped? He's God. It doesn't make sense. Because the seventh day of rest was an image of foreshadowing of the day in which God himself would rest in the tomb between his death and his resurrection. That's the true meaning of the Sabbath. The events of Christ are so significant, they don't just affect everything that came after them, but they affect everything that came before them. So when the, the people of God are fighting their enemies and... Aaron's arms are outstretched. When they fall, they're making that form of the cross, right? So Egypt, this land of death, Pharaoh, the evil one, God frees the people, right? The evil's defeated. And ultimately, how is the Pharaoh defeated? Through this, this passage through water, right? St. Paul tells us that in our baptism, we, we died to the old man. We're raised together with Christ. And so there's all these, these images. And this, this is true throughout the, the whole Exodus. And this is ultimately, this is, I think, the most important thing. This is how Christ himself read the Hebrew scriptures. He read, he understood that they were about himself. Right? Every Old Testament reference, the sign of Jonah, but he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. St. Paul, the same thing. Right? He says that that rock that followed them around the desert, giving them water, that rock is Christ. Right? And ultimately, Moses, in this case, imaging 
the people of Israel itself disobey God, and that water comes forth from the rock being struck. Christ was struck. Right? And poured forth that blood and water, which is, again, we, we talked in, in the, about Genesis last week. That's the water of baptism, the blood of the Eucharist by which Christ makes his church. Again, something that was foreshadowed on the first Friday when Adam was made and from his side comes Eve. So there's there's so many things. Um, when the waters of Mamre were bitter, how were they made sweet? On the Exodus, right? The water's bitter, it's salty, we can't drink it. What does God tell Moses to do? Yeah, put wood in there, right? Xilo, the wood of the cross, makes sweet life that had been bitter because it had been enslaved by that. Um, and so, so many, so many of these, these things. Of course, the bread that comes down from heaven, this is perhaps nowhere more clearly does Christ identify the events of the Old Testament as being fulfilled in himself. I am the true bread that came down from heaven, right? The bread your ancestors, that manna they ate, they ate and they died. But those who eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man have life everlasting. Um, and so the Pascha of the old is a shadow that finds its fulfillment in the Pascha of the new. That just as Christ, or just as Christ in the Old Testament, because ultimately it's still Christ doing this, bring, defeats Pharaoh. He defeated the devil. He plundered Hades just as he brought the people out of Egypt, that, that land of dominion by death. Um, at kind of the, the height of the Exodus, or, or literally height, right? When he gets the, the law from God on Mount Sinai, this is this is kind of a, a pinnacle point. And this is another thing that I think are, are wishy-washy translating. Like, we're going to translate it this way, we're not going to translate it this way. But ultimately, you guys know what day did God give the law to Moses on Mount Sinai? Forty days after the, uh, I can't remember the exact day. Fifty. 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 The Pentecost. Yeah. 50, 50. So Pentecost. So so again, I think if if we we need to acknowledge this connection, because like I said before, uh, you can't really understand that meaning of of the Passover in the Old Testament without the light of Christ. But the moment Christ illumines that event. It teaches us something about Christ, right? And so we actually have this uh, this dance between the Old and the New Testament. Where the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Yeah, I, I'd say, though, the, 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 the New Testament is the revealing of the Old Testament, right. right? But the Old Testament, as we get to know the Old Testament in light of Christ, it actually reveals more to us about the New Testament, right? Absolutely. We begin to understand things that... You wouldn't get just from the gospel account as we as we explore the Old Testament. So again, it's this this kind of movement back and forth. I have this this uh, beautiful quote from uh, Saint Hippolytos uh, on Pascha. Now is the time when the blessed light of Christ sheds its rays. The pure rays of the pure Spirit rise, and the heavenly treasure of divine glory are opened up. Night's darkness and obscurity have been swallowed up. And the dense blackness dispersed in this light of day. Crab death has been totally eclipsed. Life has been extended to every creature, and all things are diffused in brightness. The dawn of dawn ascends over the earth, and he who was before the morning star and before the other stars, the mighty Christ, immortal and mighty, sheds light brighter than the sun on the universe. For us as faithful, he has initiated a bright new day, long, eternal, inextinguishable. It is the mystical Pascha celebrated in figures under the law but fulfilled in the very truth by Christ. The marvelous Pascha, the wonder of divine virtue, the work of power, truly a feast, an everlasting memorial, impassibility born of suffering, immortality born of death, life born in the tomb, healing born from wounds, resurrection born from the fall, ascent to heaven born from descent to hell. God is the author of these wonders. From impossible beginnings, he produces wonderful results. 
to show you that he alone can accomplish everything he wills. Let Egypt then announce beforehand the truth in figures. Let the law interpret the figures of truth in advance, proclaiming the glorious coming of a glorious king. Let the host of Egyptian firstborn die, and let Israel be saved by the mystical sign of blood. All this is foreshadowing of what is to come. But for us today, the image has been realized. The figures are replaced by the truth. The shadow gives way to what is substantial and complete. Um, so that's a that's a little taste of one of these early church fathers, how they're, and again, St. Hippolytos is writing before the New Testament was actually established. You know, at, by the time he's writing, there's there's a more or less a consensus that there's the four gospel accounts that was very, very early on, but there's still not a, this is the scripture. And so what everybody did have access to was the Old Testament, and they're reading it again in this, this, uh, this, I, I, I make a joke. There's there's exegesis and esegesis. Jesus, this is esegesis. Right? He's the yeah. <laughs> nerd, 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 nerd joke. Um, yeah. <laughs> so again, this 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 whole Exodus story helps us make sense of what Christ did. We can only make sense of it when we look at what Christ did for us. This being brought into the promised land, right? Uh, again, this is something we touched on last week. How do the people of God enter into the promised land? By crossing the River Jordan. How does Christ open to us this new promised land, this new life in God's presence? Through baptism, through the waters of baptism. And so they, they inform each other. They help us make sense of everything. We need to always see everything in reference to one another. And I think this is a, a key, and maybe Father has some something to say about this too, one of the keys, I think, just to orthodoxy as a whole, nothing is autonomous. Nothing is isolated. You know, you can't have iconography without liturgy. You can't have church history without an understanding of the doctrine of the church. You know, everything, and that, that's how life is, right? You know, uh, I may be obsessed about this one thing, but my obsession doesn't lead me to stop sleeping and eating and drinking and be nice and wearing clothes and all these things, right? That everything needs to be held together. You know, that's why we as Orthodox, we honor the material. You know, we're not just spiritualists. We're not just emotion, right? All of it has to be kind of held together. In sequence. In sequence, yeah. Yeah, maybe. No, I was just thinking, you know, Father John Romanides says that orthodoxy is actually not a religion. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. So it's a it's a way of living. And so this whole, it's a 360 degree experience. It's a whole way of seeing the world. So as Father Mike is going through these, this narrative <clears throat> and the uh, parallelism between the Old Testament and what's fulfilled in Christ, this is the way that we should see the whole world is in terms of these narratives. Right, they they shape what is true for us, and it should affect us in all aspects of our lives. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's beautiful. Um, so, enter into the promised land, and of course, uh, God has delivered this promised land to them, but they have to do some work themselves. Right, it's not a as you know, it's not a blank slate. There's people there. And God expects them to, to fight these people, right? These different clans, these different groups that are there. And this, I think, is also an important lesson, right? God, you know, sometimes I think out from influence of some of these maybe, I don't know, prosperity gospel, we think we just name it, we claim it, right? Or just we acknowledge that God has made this, this promise to us, and we, we just kind of sit back and wait for it. But God has always... Kind of expects us to do what we can, right? And more often than not, we fail at doing what we can. Faith without works is dead. Exactly. Faith without works is dead. But we can't, workless Christianity is not Christianity, right? If we don't have the works, if we don't try, right? And this is what we'll be judged on, right? We'll be judged on, on our love for the other. We'll be judged on that work that we do. And so, yes, God delivers the promised land to the people of Israel, but they have to work for it. 
they can't win it by themselves. In fact, when they try to do it by themselves, they fail, right? They have to be obedient to God, do it the way that he does. Um, and so we have, uh, ultimately, they don't do what they're asked to do. Things don't go very well. We end up in the book of Judges. Uh, really fascinating read. Um, you know, my parents, I remember when I was a little kid, they wouldn't let me watch a PG-13 movie, but they would let me read the book of Judges. Let me tell you, <laughs> the book of Judges is like super R-rated. I mean, there's there's sex, there's violence, there's there's everything but rock and roll, and and uh, that's even debatable because there's there's definitely some heads that get crushed by rocks in the judges. Uh, but again, it's it's always the God says do this, and and sometimes I think we have this very legalistic understanding of these do's and don'ts, but I think we need to see it more in light of of God seeing His people as a parent. Right. You know, the other day, my three year old thought it would be really fun to run down hardwood floor for the, the hardwood floor steps in socks. Yeah. Right. I didn't tell him not to do that. And I didn't yell at him because, you know, I don't want you to have fun, but because I love him. I want what's best for him. This is what God was doing for Israel. I want what's best for you. Do this. And they don't. Don't do this. And they do it. Um, you know, ultimately, they asked for a king. They demanded king. King Saul, kind of the people's choice, doesn't work out too well. And so then we have David. And this, I think, is another kind of key to understanding the scriptures as a whole. Right? David was the least among his brethren. Right? God always has this tendency to... To choose the little shepherd boy, yeah, the shepherd boy, Israel. He didn't choose Syria or Babylon or Egypt. Just this, this little, little disgruntled group of people. He always chooses the little. Uh, the same thing the prophet Micah, Jeremiah, Bethlehem. You're little, but from you will come the one who is of everlasting. Right, uh, the Theotokos. Right. He's looked upon the lowest state of his handmaid, right? Literally that that littleness of his servant. Um, and I think this is this is key to how we need to live our lives. Right? God doesn't want us to be bigger. He wants us to acknowledge our smallness and let him make us big. Even yeah, even our nothingness. I mean, because yeah. uh, if you look at the uh at God's calling his people out of Egypt, you know, the, the people that he called were not a united uh, ethnic group that he, he called out of Egypt. It was a mixed group. You can tell from the names that there were different nationalities in this group. And he says later in the scriptures that he made a people out of out of those who were not a people. Mm -hmm. So he, he takes them literally from nothing and makes them into a people. <clears throat> so it's, it's all God's word, in other words. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, I mean that 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 uh, beautifully touches on on Father Gregory's sermon, right? It's not mine; it's all his. Everything that we have that that one of those last prayers we say that all good things come from the Father lights, come from above. Everything is from Him. Um, I have nothing. I have nothing of my own. And this is also kind of the, I'm jumping the gun quite a bit here, but that's also part of the big beauty of the liturgy. Right? The priest says, your own of your own, we offer to you. And all for all, because we have nothing of our own to offer. Right. Yeah, we have we have what he's given us, right? You know, like the little kid who asks his dad, you know, for 20 bucks so that he can buy him a Father's Day present. And the dad <laughs> says, oh, that's beautiful. Here's $20. Go buy it. Oh. Dad, I need a ride to the store. I've got to give you a ride to the store. I can't reach it. I've got to put it down for you. But the, the joy, the joy of giving, even though it's not ours to give, it's been given to us. It, it, again, it's this, this movement back and forth. Um, so King David, King David, a man after God's own heart, uh, the author of many of our Psalms, uh, most importantly, the, the ancestor of, of our Lord. Right. Throughout the, the gospel accounts, he's often referred to as 
the son of David. Um, David of repentance. Was that king of repentance? Yes, the king, the king of repentance, the king of repentance. Um, and and of course, despite his his goodness, he still messes up. His son Solomon, despite his wisdom, still messes up. Um, you know, if, if you really think about it, the scriptures are really kind of kind of weird if you compare it to other world religions. Even if you look at the Quran, a lot of the stories in the Old Testament are in the Quran, but the Quran never says anything bad about them, right? It doesn't show the failure of David. It doesn't show the failure of Moses. It doesn't. In some ways, these failures are highlighted in the scripture, right? There's there's just a matter, just a few individuals apart from God himself that aren't kind of uh, having their their blemishes pointed out by the scriptures and I think I think there's 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 a lot to that one God alone is holy the people the temple everything is holy in so far as it participates in his holiness uh, but also I think it's it's a hope it gives us hope you know David is beloved David was in some ways, in some images, apart from Adam and Eve, the first to, to recognize and be brought into the light from Hades at the resurrection of Christ. Um, you know, so so even when we fail him, you know, God doesn't cease loving us and continues to open to us a way of, of repentance. I think our failures put a help put an emphasis on repentance as well. Exactly. That, that way of repentance has to be open and walked. And this is, again, another example of that, that, that synergy. Right? It's not God just giving us a blank check to get into paradise. It's not dependent on us doing it ourselves. We couldn't do. Um, it's this, this God gives us the, the grace to walk that path of repentance, shows it to us. And the church brings us together as a family. The walk because as we gather, we're all broken, looking for, seeking for his love and help. And that repentance is within us when we approach the Eucharist, and once we reach it, we feel now you're, now you're jumping 20 lessons. <laughs> but but he does he does have a beautiful, a beautiful point talking about about the 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 Eucharist. Because again, if you think about it. What's what's smaller than that? Just a, what what to the world looks like a, a crumb and a drop of wine, sure. by which all of the cosmos, all of creation, becomes inflamed with the life and energy of of the Trinity. That single point remakes all of creation at every dimension. What a what a beautiful thing! None of when we're completely unworthy of it, but through His grace, through our struggle on the path of repentance uh you receive the gift um can i talk about it yeah, 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 please, please. so uh i think this is the key to unlocking romans paul's romans and to understanding uh who what is israel which is even in the news today you know who is israel what is israel we support israel but what 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 is israel that we support so <clears throat> if after with david's king it passes on to Solomon. Solomon, the scriptures tell us, was arrogant. And he didn't listen to his father's advisors. And he ends up splitting Israel, right, into the 10 northern tribes, which were called, took the name Israel, and the two southern tribes, which had, were Judah and Benjamin. It made Judah was the largest of the tribe, the largest tribe. So it was called Judah, the southern kingdom. And so Solomon, you know, remained, and his line remained in Judah, the southern kingdom. The northern 10 tribes formed Israel. And what happens in 721 BC, the Assyrians come out of from the northeast, <clears throat> they come down and they capture this northern kingdom in 721 BC. So about 200 after about 200 years of uh, independence of living, living side by side, Judah and Israel, uh, after about 200 years, that ends because the Assyrians come in and they conquer Israel, the northern ten kingdoms, leaving only Judah and Benjamin in the south, the kingdom of Judah. <clears throat> Why is this important? 
So those, what happens to those 10 tribes? Mm -hmm. Because there are 12 tribes of Israel, but what happens to those 10 tribes? This is what is called the, the lost tribes of Israel. If you've ever heard that expression, the lost tribes of Israel, and sometimes there might be some documentary or about trying to find the lost tribes of Israel, and maybe it's connected genetically with some group in Ethiopia or South America. There's all kinds of uh, genetic uh, attempts to trace this. The, the point, though, is <laughs> the important point is that the Assyrians came in and they took out, this was common in the ancient world, when you conquered a land, you removed some of the people from that land, you took them back into your homeland to assimilate them, and you also put some colonizers, you put some of your people and gave them land in this new conquered area. So you, you're mixing up the population, both in your own homeland by importing some of these foreigners and in the new land that you conquered by sending some of your people to colonize the land. So the, the people get all mixed up. So, and from there, <clears throat> the 10 tribes of Israel scatter. Across, this is what's known as the diaspora. You've heard that term before, the diaspora. The, the spreading is what it means literally. So as the these people spread throughout the Roman, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout what would later become the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and when Paul's talking in Romans about Israel, especially if you're reading chapters 9 through 11, and this is frequently misunderstood, uh, uh, especially by some Protestant groups, the church's position <clears throat> is, is that what Paul's saying about grafting in. So you have, imagine you have this tree, <clears throat> and if you cut off a branch, it leaves a hole, right? And in that hole, you can actually take another branch and you can graft it into that hole. <clears throat> so what Paul's saying is that those Jews who are not believing, uh, I've been taken off, have been cut off. Those Jews who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah are being cut off. There's a hole there. And the Gentiles, who he connects with the lost 10 tribes of Israel. So he's saying, in other words, that these lost 10 tribes of Israel spread and scattered and assimilated into the Gentiles. So there's there's uh, so that the 10 tribes now is are mixed with the gentiles and these gentiles who are coming back are reconstituting israel so when the gentiles come in and are grafted into that hole where the where the Ju judeans the people of judah have fallen away by not believing in jesus now these gentiles who are connected with the lost 10 tribes are coming in and taking their place <laughs> and therefore reconstituting the fullness of israel all 12 tribes so this is why the church, this is called a supersessionist sometimes by the Protestants, a supersessionist uh, theology, <clears throat> which means that we believe that the church supersedes Israel. Well, that's not exactly correct. That's that's how they term it. Uh, what we believe is that the church is reconstituted and is, becomes the new Israel and becomes the fulfilled Israel with all the tribes reunited uh, in the church so that the church is the new Israel. Does that make sense? <clears throat> But it's all coming from this important historical event of the Assyrian cap the Assyrians taking down the northern ten tribes of Israel. And then, of course, you have, after that, you have in 587 BC, you have <clears throat> the Babylonian captivity in which the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, the same thing happens to them. They're conquered. Some of their leading intellectuals, their political leaders, their religious leaders are taken into Babylon. <clears throat> Babylonians are sent into Judea to mix with the population, the same thing happens. And there's this period of the Babylonian captivity that lasts for less than a hundred years <clears throat> until the people come back and they rebuild the temple. Yeah, and, and uh, it's it's really amazing to, to look at all the, the moving pieces and see how the stage is being set for the advent of Christ, right? Like even things that seem tragic, like like uh, the exile. You know, it, a lot of Jews ended up in, in Babylon, but a lot of them ended up in North Africa, and so you have huge communities really throughout the Mediterranean world, and then you have the scriptures starting to be translated into Greek. We have the 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 Septuagint here. Um, and so people that, okay, I've got these new neighbors, they're a little bit different. <clears throat> Let me hear what their book says. 
And so you actually start having growing influence from Judaism into what would be thought of as the, the pagan Mediterranean world. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of Plato, right? And everybody, or a lot of people are probably familiar with the term Neoplatonism. And some people say, well, what about the middle? It's middle Platonism. And uh, that's not a term that's used too often, but the, the, the man, at least, and, and there's really more, but the one man who's considered kind of that middle Platonist, that bridge between the Platonists and the Neoplatonists, was a Jewish philosopher named Philo of Alexandria. And so there's there's a lot of influence. There's and and there's other things, you know. Alexander, yeah. he conquers the world, <clears throat> spreads the language. So now not only is from that Babylonian exile, uh, our people encounter with the people of God are mixing mixing with it, but now you know someone in Persia. Can read the scriptures. In fact, some people say that the the magi who visited Christ at his birth found uh, a scroll that was was left by some Jewish rabbi, and that's what kind of led them to go to the West. Um, a legend, a tradition, but but I think it makes an interesting point. This this is a good point I want to underline is that so when Alexander the Great, it's about 300, 300 something BC, when he suddenly takes over uh, and expand and creates his empire all the way to India, <clears throat> he spreads throughout the known Western world, throughout the Mediterranean, and then even far east to, to, to as far as India, he spreads this Greek culture called Hellenism. Um, and it includes education, <clears throat> includes the language. And the way I usually explain it to people is like, uh, it's, it's similar to the way that English unites the world today, or that French used to unite the world, the lingua franca, the common language that the world speaks. And now today it's English. But the same thing happened with Greek. Uh, this by, by conquering such a wide area and, and uh, letting Hellenism uh, influence the local cultures, Greek became the lingua franca. Greek became what is English today. <clears throat> and so this affects the Jews who are spread out throughout the Mediterranean Empire. A lot of times the, the typical narrative of 19th century German scholars, Protestant German scholars, is that Hellenism, the Greek tradition, came in under the church in like the fourth century AD, <clears throat> and that it changed the church and made it Hellenistic and more Gentile and not as Jewish, etc. But that is really a false narrative. What really happened was Hellenism penetrated into the Jewish world 300 years before Christ. <clears throat> so already you have this another mixing of cultures. You have Hellenism being mixed with Jewish culture, and you have all these synagogues being uh, established in Greece and throughout the Mediterranean, which, which eventually Paul goes to <clears throat> and preaches to them throughout in Greece, etc. And but, there's nice roads that were built by, by the, the Romans, Romans right? And so they, there's only so many pirates out there. As, so <laughs> Pax Romana, that's another yes. example of, of how the, the history shaped history. The way the church views it is that all of this history, including Alexander the Great, was part of God's plan mm -hmm. for the spreading of the gospel. Um, and so it's, Hellenism becomes ingrained into the Jewish tradition, and it's represented by this Philo of Alexandria, who lived about 50 BC. Um, and Philo was heavily was a pious Jew, but also he was very Hellenized. He was really Greek as well as Jewish. <clears throat> and so he combines Greek philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, from 400 BC with the Jewish scriptures. He interprets the Jewish scriptures in light of Greek philosophy. And Greek philosophy comes to be seen as another, as another line of prophets. So the Greek philosophers, like the Hebrew prophets, the Greek philosophers were also preparing the Gentile pagan people to receive Christ. Does that make sense? So by by speculating about the oneness of God in the Greek philosophical tradition. This was unheard of uh, in paganism, but it develops in the Greek philosophical tradition that there's <clears throat> that God is one, the real God is one. Starting, you know, Socrates talks about this. 
And so he's preparing the people who are influenced by this Greek culture, by Greek education and Greek language for the coming of uh, Christianity, as well as how the Hebrew prophets prepared the Hebrew people for the coming of Christianity. Does that makes sense. So it's really important how Alexander the Great sets the stage for uh, Hellenism and to become <laughs> this great <clears throat> cultural mixing with uh, Judaism, which eventually gives birth. It's this that gives birth to Christianity. So already Christianity, even in its earliest Jewish stages, already has Hellenism baked into it. It doesn't come later. Right. Not, nothing nothing in a vacuum. Um, yeah, so so uh, one one of the, the things that I wanted to do, I, I want to share another reading. This one actually is also by St. Hippolytus of Rome, um, or attributed to him, it probably isn't, but that's another, another story. Uh, just an example of how the early church saw a lot of what we're, we've been speaking about through the reading of the Old Testament. And this is, this is I think, a real, real powerful example, not just of, of how they read the Old Testament, but how, in a sense, so much of the Old Testament the St. Maximus says, is locked without the key of the cross and can't be read without the light of the resurrection. Let me just say real quick, uh, uh, in light of Alexander the Great, one of the things that that's most important that happens is because the Greek language becomes the unifying language, there's this push, especially in the Jewish communities outside of Palestine, outside of the Holy Land, there's this push to translate the scriptures into Greek, which is the language they understand, right? Because Hebrew by this time, even in the Holy Land, was becoming a dead language that only the priests and the rabbis knew, right? So the language that they spoke was Aramaic, which was different within this ancient Hebrew. So even in Palestine, we have evidence that um, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament comes back into Palestine, and they're reading sometimes the Greek translation because they don't know the Hebrew. So Alexander the Great provides the impetus for the translation of the scriptures into Greek, which, as Father Micah said, then leads to all these other people who are living around the Jews to uh, have access to what it is the Jews believe to yeah, read. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, the vast majority uh, of the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament mm -hmm. is is from the Septuagint, um, uh, which is the Greek translation. Which is that from Greek about, translation from about three hundred BC? Right. So, how many of you have Proverbs chapter nine memorized? Need a joke. It's okay. I'll, that's why I'll read it. <laughs> so this this is this is this is again this is just one of those like what I'll read it. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maids to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who is without sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. This is how St. Hippolytus, Christ, he, here Solomon, means the wisdom and power of God the Father has built his house, i.e. his nature in the flesh derived from the virgin. Even as he, John, has said before time, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As likewise the wise prophet testifies, wisdom that was before the world and is the source of life, the infinite wisdom of God, hath built her house by a mother who knew no man. To it as he assumed the temple of the body, and hath raised her seven pillars. That is the fragrant grace of the all Holy Spirit, as Isaiah says, and the seven spirits of God shall rest upon him. But others say that the seven pillars are the seven divine orders which sustain the creation by his holy and inspired teaching. To it the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, the hierarchs, the hermits, the saints, and the righteous. And the phrase, she has killed her beasts, denotes the prophets and martyrs who in every city and country are slain like sheep every day by the unbelieving on behalf of the truth, and cry aloud, for your sake we killed all the day long. We were counted as sheep for the slaughter. And again, she has mingled her wine in the bowl by which is meant that the Savior, uniting his Godhead like pure wine with the flesh and the virgin, was born of her at once, God and man, without confusion of the one and the other. And she has furnished her table. That denotes the promised knowledge of the Holy Trinity. It also refers to his honored and undefiled body and blood which day by day are administered and offered sacrificially 
the spiritual divine table as a memorial of that first and ever memorable table of the spiritual divine supper. And again, she has sent forth her servants, wisdom that is to say has done so, Christ, summoning them with lofty announcements. Whoso is simple, let him turn to me. She says, alluding manifestly to the holy apostles who traversed the whole world and followed the nations to the knowledge of him and truth with their lofty and divine preaching. And again, and to those that want understanding, she said, that is to those who have not yet obtained the power of the Holy Spirit. Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled for you, by which is meant that he gave his divine flesh and honor blood to us to eat and to drink it for the remission of sins. Wow, that's wonderful. That's great. Completely opens up this very enigmatic thing. But again, this is how the, the church read it. They read the Old Testament in light and being about, about the, the new. That passage is read at, at some of the feasts of the yeah. church during the Vesper service where Old Testament scriptures are, are read. Yeah, this is this is one that, that the church has gone to uh, again and, and again. One. There's there's another another quote here um, I think is is uh, also important for us to remember. Um, this is from Saint Maximus the Confessor. Hence, a person who seeks God with true devotion should not be dominated by the literal text, lest he unwittingly receive not God, but things appertaining to God. That is, lest he feel a dangerous affection for the words of Scripture instead of for the word, the Logos, Christ. Um, and I think this is this is something that, uh, especially here in the, the South, where there's there's uh, elements of, of fundamentalism. Um, we have to remember that it's the word, right? The word of God is the uncreated second person of the Trinity. It's not a book. It's not a text. Now, that's not to say that it's not sacred and holy, but that text is to lead us into a relationship with the word of God. Right? That we have to be careful not to get too attached to that which pertains to God. And even can make an idol out of that which pertains to him instead of him himself. Uh, it's... Yeah, so I'm just covering the rest of this lesson here. It's kind of a, a history outline. So, <clears throat> you know, you have 300 BC or so that you have Alexander the Great. Um, and then uh, when he dies, suddenly uh, the, his vast empire is divided among his successors, the, the Avoki and, and Greek, the, his generals. Um, and so the, the whole land, uh, Judea, is under occupation by this Greek empire. <clears throat> and they actually, uh, the emperor, uh, Antiochus IV, defiles the temple, right? Um, he goes and sacrifices a pig, of all things, in the Jewish temple. He sets himself up as a god to be worshipped, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Uh, and this, this uh, triggers uh, an uprising uh, in Judea with the Maccabees. The Maccabees come along about maybe 200 BC, something like that, and they revolt and they throw off the and they throw off their Greek uh, overlords and they establish again a small independent kingdom, a small independent Israel, if you will. This is called the, it's from the Maccabees, but it's called the Hasmonean period. <clears throat> And so this lasts until uh, the Romans come along, which is shortly before the time of Christ. Uh, you have maybe 50 BC, something like that. The Romans come along and conquer this independent Judea again. And so when we come to Jesus' time, uh, as we all know, Palestine is under Roman occupation. And again, there's this kind of uh, fervor to revolt. You know, because again, their, their religion is not being respected entirely by the Romans. They are, the Romans respect some things, but they don't. The Jews are certainly not autonomous by any sense of the word. Uh, and so there's this brewing uh, uprising and revolt, and this is what ends up being. Uh, people mistake Jesus for this uh, uprising leader who's going to lead this revolt against the Romans and throw off the Roman overlords, that he's going to be this military figure like the Maccabees. 
who's going to lead this revolt and restore Jewish independence. But of course, we know that he's a different kind of Messiah, a different kind of savior, not a military figure. <clears throat> and then around this time also, you have the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So, you know, like I was saying, when the 587 uh, BC, when the Babylonians came, <clears throat> Uh, and conquered uh, Judea, the southern kingdom, they destroyed the temple. When the Jews came back after the Babylonian exile, they rebuilt the temple, which is called the Second Temple. And sometimes you'll hear people talk about the Second Temple period. It's from about 500 BC until 70 AD when the Second Temple is destroyed. But in the time of King Herod, who's a little bit before, of course, Jesus's birth, you know, so maybe 20 BC or so on, he starts this project. When the second temple was rebuilt, the Jews had just returned from exile and they didn't have a lot of wealth to put into the temple. So the second temple was fairly simple. So when Herod comes along, Herod, the Herod's fairly wealthy, and one of the things he does is he pours money into the temple. <clears throat> so it's he, it says the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem by King Herod, and that's not exactly correct because it's not rebuilding a new temple, but it's greatly expanding the existing second temple. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in the time of Herod, the time of Jesus, <clears throat> about expanding the temple complex. So, so the complex grows much larger. And then in 70 AD, the Romans, after a failed revolutionary attempt by the Jewish people, uh, and this this had been, you know, the, the Romans were constantly dealing with these uprisings from the Jews. <clears throat> and if you look at the Romans and the Roman army compared to the Jews, it was like an elephant and an ant. You know, it was uh, David and Goliath. And so the Romans uh, were pestered by the Jewish uprisings. But finally, around 70 AD, there was a, a, another uprising from 66 to 70 AD uh, that leads to all kinds of problems for the fledgling Christian community as well. The, the Christians have to flee. Uh, but what happens to the Jews is the Romans say, that's it, we've had enough of you. And they come in and they wipe them out. <clears throat> They destroy the second temple and Herod's, all of Herod's uh, reconstruction work that he had done. They level it, which to this day, it hasn't been rebuilt. There is no third temple. Uh, and so that's that's where we end on the history for this lesson. But I, you know, I mentioned, so we talked a little bit about what is Israel. So from the church's perspective, the church is Israel, right? So how do we think as Orthodox Christians... How do we think about modern events in Israel? And, and part of what's tied up in American interest in Israel and American support of Israel is there is a belief among some fundamentalists, uh, that, fundamentalist Christians that the third temple has to be rebuilt. <clears throat> that uh, in order, because it says in the scripture that the Antichrist will take up his throne in the temple, it says in a verse in, I think, Second Thessalonians, that therefore they say, well, because the scripture, this is what the scripture says in this one verse, that the Antichrist will take up his throne in the temple. Well, there's no temple. So the Antichrist has nowhere to take up his throne. So Jesus can't come because the Antichrist has to come before Jesus comes back. <clears throat> so therefore they say, well, you have to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And this is a, a lot of what's behind uh, fundamentalist support for Israel, is there's this kind of secret push to rebuild the temple uh, on the Temple Mount. Although the, the irony is that that's probably never going to happen, because <clears throat> what happened when the temple was destroyed, Judaism changed completely. So that we talk about uh, modern Judaism dates from the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Uh, modern Judaism is based on really the Pharisees. Once the temple was destroyed, the priests lost all their power, right? So the priests were no longer, the Levites were no longer the religious authorities. Because there was no temple, there was no sacrifices to be done, which is, was the priest's job. Instead, the only thing that they could do was the Torah. They could study the scriptures. They could study the law, the Torah. <clears throat> and so that became the domain of the scribes and the, the learned rabbis, which were the Pharisees. So really, modern Judaism is born out of the Pharisees, and about 70 AD, shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection. <clears throat> and modern Judaism is built on the power of the rabbis, the scholars. So they have no incentive whatsoever to try to rebuild the temple, because if they did, they would immediately lose all their authority. It would go back to the priests, who still are, are you know, Jew, Jews still trace 
the descent of the Levites, and they know who the Levites are, who the priests are. You know, someone with the last name Cohen, for example, means they're from a priestly family. <clears throat> and so if the temple were to be rebuilt, all these people who have priestly lineage would be expected to come back and start offering the sacrifices again. But that's never going to happen in a modern state of Israel. So there's this tension there, and it has to do, it has, I, I'm kind of trying to point out how foreign affairs have to do with this theological understanding of what is the church, what's the necessity of the temple, etc. And and I think that's a, a great point to maybe conclude with. We talked we began by talking about this idea of typology of, of foreshadowing. Uh, the temple, the tabernacle, right? And and God is very clear in the Old Testament, you know, why are you making me a house? The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. The heavens are my throne, the earth my footstool. Because again, it was uh, a type of foreshadowing a foreshadowing of the one who herself would truly contain within her womb the uncontainable God. Our Theotokos is the temple, the, the temple of Solomon, the temple, the tabernacle, the second temple, all of which was, was looking forward to. And so this Thursday is the 21st of November, uh, and this is the day that we remember the Virgin Mary, the mother of the Lord, entering into the temple as a three-year-old child. And, and this is the Quandacion of that great feast day. One of the hymns. The... Yeah, yeah. Today, the most pure temple of the Savior. So this is in reference to the Virgin Mary. Today, the most pure temple of the Savior, the precious bridal chamber and virgin the sacred treasure of God enters the house of the Lord. See, she's referred to as temple. The, the second temple is referred to now as, as house. So it's still valued, but it's showing. And then this is, this is the real shocking part. Bringing the grace of the divine spirit. Now, uh, just a little aside there. As great as the second temple was, and as much as Herod worked at building it and making it beautiful, there was something very key missing. Whenever a sacrifice took place at the Temple of Solomon, there was no way. Where did my matches go? I didn't have to worry about matches because, again, this is what the scriptures say, fire fell from heaven and consumed the gifts. They rebuild the temple, and something's missing. Not only is the Holy of Holies empty now, because they couldn't find what was there, but, I mean, just imagine those first priests to do a sacrifice in the second, second temple. It's like... <laughs> this, is, this is one of the reasons why you had people like the Essenes, people like the Zealots, they're like, oh... It's because we're not following the law right. It's because these, these defiling Romans are in the Holy Land. We got to kick them out so that, in a sense, the divine presence returns to the temple. That, that was something that was being debated. In the, on the Old Testament, the, in the first temple, there was the visible presence of the Shekinah, yeah, yeah. the Spirit of the Lord, the, what we would call the Holy Spirit, actually was visibly present entering into the first temple but it never and there's never in the scriptures anything including ezekiel there's nothing about uh that ever happening at the second temple so this is what he's talking about is that it, and this was something kind of in the consciousness of the second temple jews was that god had never visibly shown himself coming back into the temple and so what the hymn is saying is this is actually happening when the virgin goes and dedicates herself to the temple. She's bringing the Holy Spirit back into the temple for the first time in 500 years. Bringing the grace of the divine spirits. The angels of God praise her. And then this last line, she is the heavenly tabernacle. And then, of course, through the incarnation that took place through her, we ourselves are able to now become temples of, of, of Christ. So again, you know, the, 
the person, right? The person, not the building, is where where God God dwelt fully in the Virgin Mary, but also by grace in in, in us Christians. And of course, Jesus is the temple as well. Yes, yeah, he yeah. says he says uh, what gets him in trouble with the Jewish leaders is that he says he will tear down this temple and rebuild it in three right, days. Right. right, and then John tells us in parentheses he was referring to his own body. Um, so in Jesus's body, we have the reconstitute. We have the, the third temple now, mm -hmm. uh, and that body is us, the church. So right. again, this identification of Israel. The temple with the with the church. <clears throat> Anybody have any burning questions? So would that make the the you know we're talking about in the third temple, the Antichrist will take his seat. Yeah, is that the spirit of the Antichrist in us and our willingness or unwillingness to repent? Is that essentially what this? That's a good question. So so Saint Dorothos has a real real uh, powerful. Uh, interpretation of that. He says what's being referred to there is you judging your neighbor. Right? He says you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ alone is the judge. When you judge, you are putting yourself in the place <laughs> of Christ, right? On <laughs> the Christo. Uh, we always think of uh, the way we use anti against Christ, but andi really means in place of. So when I judge my neighbor, I've put myself in the place of Christ. I've made myself Christ, and I've done so as as uh, I've, in a sense I'm defiling the temple that I am, self or or you know bringing in division. In the the body of Christ, the church, which is which is the temple, um, yeah. So so Saint Jerome says there's there's no nothing is more akin or likens us more to the Antichrist than to to judge, right? which is a pretty scary thing. Yeah. Well, so what we're also thinking about is uh, for the third temple to be built, you need to find the Ark of the Covenant again, which is missing. Well, the second one never had it either. Right. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? All right, Indiana Jones. Hey. Yeah.